and it, it's it's really very rewarding to be here, um, having been at many of the early Kosh meetings, which really could have fit at one or two of these tables. Um, so to see you, and, and um, it's really great for me to be here on behalf of the federal government, on behalf of the Labor Department, on behalf of the Obama administration, to thank you for your great work. Um, you play a vital role in ensuring that American workers are as protected as they are. And certainly, we don't think that they're protected enough. But um, the work that you do day in, day out, has a big impact on. Can you hear? Me? No. no. Is this better? Yeah. Okay. The work that you do day in, day out, has a huge impact on workers, their families, their communities, and we greatly value that. I, you know, from the point of view of OSHA, we look at you as our closest allies. You are on a daily basis working with workers who we haven't reached, we can't reach, to make sure they're safe. So if I step back from it and talk about the OSHA law, you know, we're 40, OSHA is 42 years old, 43 years old, and the OSHA law is very simple. It says two things primarily. It says one is employers have the responsibility to provide a safe workplace. So in other words, it's the right of every worker to be able to work in a workplace free of hazards. And the other thing it says is that it's OSHA's responsibility to make sure employers provide that safe workplace. And that's a huge challenge. You know, we're a small agency, we're underfunded, um, but we're eager to work with groups like, people like you, groups like the Kashas, because you're really on the front lines making sure those changes take place, making sure workers are protected. Now the workplace has changed a great deal in the United States since 1970. And everybody knows that, but we often don't think what that means and, and how that sets us back and how it makes it so much more challenging. 1970, when most people went into their workplace, they received a, a check for, you know, from the company whose name was on the door. Now you go into a workplace and you could be working for someone who really has no relationship with the, the company that produces the product that does that work. We have workers who are sent by staffing agencies and probably about three million people at any one time are, are temporary workers sent by a staffing agency to work in a different workplace. We have contractors and subcontractors and sub-subcontractors who often have, again, very little, those workers have very little relationship to the company uh, you know, whose name is on the door and they pay a price for that. And uh, We don't think about what that means, but it's very significant. You know, a few years ago, in Texas City, there was a very well-known explosion at a BP uh, refinery. A BP oil refinery, which I, I believe 17 or 18 workers were killed and more than 100 injured. Not a single one of those workers killed actually was working for BP. They were working for various contractors. And then, of course, we have the issue of what we call misclassification, and it's very common in the construction industry, where employers will claim that all the workers working for them are independent contractors, which really is just a way to say, I'm not going to pay them tax. I'm not going to pay taxes on them, and I may not even pay them minimum wage. That they're really, they're really their own contractors, they're just doing a certain task for me. So what that means, though, is that we have to be creative, and we have to think very differently about what's going on in the workplace. And we have to reach out to workers who don't just speak English. And most workers in the United States in 1971 and 1970 spoke English, or a lot more than now. Now we have workers who speak dozens of different languages across our workplaces. Many of them don't know what their rights are. Many of them are afraid to assert their rights because something could happen to them um, because, they're, because of the, their documentation to be in the United States. And so these are gigantic challenges to make sure that workers are safe. But we know if any workers aren't safe, then no workers are safe. And that's because we know if employers can hire workers who they don't care about, who are not going to complain, who will, if they're injured will never even apply for comp and they'll disappear, then that threatens every worker in the United States. Because who's going to, if an employer can say I can save money by hiring this worker who doesn't speak English or isn't here legally, we know that, or is sent by the temporary staffing agency, we know that that means that the standards for all workers will go down. And so OSHA is very much focused on the most vulnerable workers because we have to raise up the floor. We have to make sure everybody has reasonably good working conditions and that their temporary status 
their documentation in the United States, their lack of English is not taken advantage of. So, so I think people know some of what OSHA does here. We have inspectors around the country. We do a relatively small number of inspections given um, the size of the, the American workforce. With our state partners, we do about 90,000 inspections. But there are between 7 and 8 million workplaces in the United States, with 130 million workers. So we try to do everything we can, and I think the OSHA staff are really remarkable. And actually, if you don't know the OSHA staff closest to you, you should. I think at this table here, we have the largest contingent. So I want to introduce them. I want them to stand up so you meet them. We've got four of our labor liaisons here. Um, Laura Kenny, who's from New York. Jim Seary from Philadelphia. Laura Story from Atlanta. And Jeff Rose from San Francisco. And if you're in their region, you should know them. They're the people to go to. Uh, in addition, uh, I'm very pleased to have Caitlin Harwood here, who's a new member of our communication staff. And, and, and most importantly, OSHA's senior policy advisor, former chief of staff, and the person who probably does more to run the agency than any of us. So all together, we're trying to work out how we do inspections better, so we have a bigger impact, how we get information out to employers, because there are a lot of employers that want to do the right thing, and how we work with groups like yours and how we reach out to workers, because we can't just rely on employers to do the right thing. There are certainly many, many employers who recognize that not only is it important just on the basic human rights level to make sure workers aren't injured, but they actually recognize that if they run their business in a safe way, they will be more productive, they will have a more productive workforce, they will be a more profitable company. And there are many employers who will, who will assert this, and there's very good evidence. But for some reason, not all employers get this. And, and they, they're, they're sort of a race to the bottom and ways to, to pay workers less and not to fix the working conditions that are causing them to be injured or to be killed. And so we're trying to, we know that we have to make sure that workers know what their rights are and that they feel comfortable asserting their rights or else they won't be protected. So we have a number of initiatives, and I think you probably heard about some of them, but we are very much focused on temporary workers because we get reports on a weekly basis of a worker killed their first day on the job. And it's, it, this is really unthinkable, but you can imagine what happens. A worker is assigned to a workplace by a staffing agency. The staffing agency often knows very little about what goes on there. The worker is given a job, says, go do this, and they go up on the roof, they're told to go up on the roof and clean something up, and you know the roof turns out rotten, and they fall through. Or uh, um, some of you may have heard me talk about uh, Lawrence Day Davis, who's a 21-year-old from Jacksonville, Florida, who was um, sent by a staffing agency to the Bacardi Bottling Corporation facility in Jacksonville, and there's a, they have a machine there called a palletizer, and that puts the pallets together of, of the, the bottles, I assume, of, the, of rum, because it's Bacardi. And there's a lot of glass on the, the ground. And there's a machine that says in big letters, the picture is, dangers do not enter. That's your first day on the job. And the foreman gives you a broom and says, clean up the glass underneath that machine. What are you going to do? Well, Dave Davis went and cleaned up that glass. And that was the last thing he did. He was crushed by that machine. We get reports like this as I said, on a weekly basis. All summer long, we're getting reports of workers sent by a staffing agency to help do a job, an outside job. Several of them were working for companies that do garbage collection. And the job, of course, is to run alongside the garbage truck, pick up the garbage, put it in the truck, and keep running. And without acclimatization, without training, you just can't do that on a hot day in Houston. And we had fatalities on the first day of work this summer doing that. And we had more and more of them. So we recognize that temporary workers are particularly vulnerable. And again, this is no surprise. There have been studies for 100 years showing that workers in their first month at work are three or four times more likely to be injured than workers who have working for a year. And a new worker, a temporary worker, can be a new worker six times a year or eight times a year. And when you talk to employers, they say, well, of course, I have to make sure my workers are protected. But you can imagine 
an employer brings in a temporary worker who's not going to be there for very long. Maybe they hired them because they know they don't want to pay higher work, their higher workers' compensation premiums because you know the premium, you know, temporary agencies have low premiums because they're not thought of as dangerous employers. So you bring a temporary worker, you're not going to do the training. You're not going to do the education that's necessary to make sure that worker is safe. Well, OSHA's position is every worker has that same right to a safe workplace. There is no distinction between a temporary worker, a contract worker, or a full-time worker. The employer is responsible, and we think actually both employers are jointly responsible for making workers safe. But to do this, we need your help. We need to know where temporary workers are who are exposed to these hazards, and to help us reach out to them, both to tell them what their rights are, but to tell us where to go, tell us who to reach out to, who to go and do inspections at where people aren't safe. And I recognize that injured workers, in many cases, don't even apply for workers' compensation, because they're afraid to. And so there's an injury, they hurt their back, they hurt their hand, they may not be able to work for a week or two, but they think that's, that's a, a lower price to pay than reporting the injury and then losing their job. And so we need to hear about those cases. We obviously don't want to jeopardize anyone's position, but we need to pursue that with them. Um, we've got to identify those low-world employers who aren't giving workers safe workplaces or who are just retaliating against them for reporting injuries, and we need to go after them. And we need to help to do that. Another of OSHA's important programs is whistleblower protection. Now, the OSHA law is very clear. It says that workers shouldn't be retaliated against for raising a safety and health concern. Not just with OSHA, but with the employer. But if you say, this is, this is hazardous, can you fix it? That worker should suffer no retaliation. But it's unfortunate that too often that worker is retaliated against. And I wish I could say that OSHA will step in immediately and do everything they can to protect that worker, but um, the law is weak, and we don't have enough tools to do that. We hope to change that. But again, we still do want to work with you to identify cases, and you have to get them to us very quickly, because these cases have a 30-day limit. If we don't hear about within 30 days of the retaliation, we can do nothing. I see a lot of people nodding their head. I hope they haven't learned this from the, from the unfortunate experience when a worker calls us 35, 40 days after they've been fired, and it's too late, and there's nothing we can do. But this is a very important issue, and we, not, we want your help on that. Another area that we've been, I think, very successful with, making progress on, and um, something we've been doing for a number of years now, is um, the question of incentive programs that give bonuses or give material benefits supposedly to groups of workers when they have low injury rates or they have no injuries. It's very common, you have a, um, and this ha we've seen this over and over again, an employer will say, if no one's injured for a certain period of time, at the end of that period, everybody gets, it could be a raffle for a, a pickup truck to just getting a share in a pizza. But that has a very powerful impact on workers. What it does is it tells workers to use peer pressure on their coworkers not to report injury, because every worker is impacted by that one injury being reported. And so as a result of that, we've seen too many times injuries not being reported, and as a result of that, there's nothing done to prevent the next injury from occurring. So we've made it very clear that we think programs like that are not acceptable, and for those employers who are in the programs that we run, like our voluntary protection program, they can't have, um, they can't have incentive programs like that. And hundreds of, of employers actually have dropped those programs. And we're very gratified that that's happened. But um, again, we need your help to find those programs, identify them, and let's work with those employers to change that. We have campaigns that we're, I think many of you are involved in. Every summer we work, we're really focused on heat. Um, dozens of workers are killed every year in, um, from heat. This is out. This is not complicated. We know how to prevent heat stroke. We know how to prevent people dying from heat. They need water, rest, and shade. And Cal OSHA started this and started a great program, and now we're pushing it very hard, um, trying to reach out to employers to say, this is what workers' rights are. This is what you must do. But also to reach out to workers and giving them tools to protect themselves. One thing we've done with some success, we have a smartphone app. 
if you haven't seen it, you should download it, because it says, this is what OSHA says, if its temperature is a certain temperature, humidity will actually tell you what that is. Um, OSHA says, this is how often to take a, take a break, this is how often to get shade, um, and workers use that to show their form and say, this is what OSHA says, this is what you should do. Similarly, with fall protection, we've got some great tools, we're working closely with NIOSH, National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, and John Howard is here, you'll hear from him, um, and folks from CPWR, to get word out on falls. So those, those are some of the things, and I can talk about a lot of them, I know we have limited amount of time, but there's one other bigger thing I want to talk about. You know, we can talk about a lot of the initiatives and the specific reasons people are getting hurt, but there's a larger social issue that really disturbs me, and I'm hoping that this is something we can work on together. There is no outrage in the United States when a worker is killed. The exception are coal miners, and I don't begrudge them this at all. You know, if two coal miners are caught in an um, underground mine, or six or even one, that usually makes the news. And there's sometimes a rescue, and that goes on, and, and the country cares about them, and that's a wonderful thing. But every day, 12 workers are killed on the job. Most of them are alone, and sometimes they make the local press. But you know, often what's said is, well, first, you know, that was a, you know, that's a hazard of the job. It's this phrase, occupational hazard, which you may have heard, you know, that sort of assumes it's okay. That's a risk that comes with the job. But if you read the article in the newspaper that follows most every fatality, those fatalities do make the newspaper, it usually will say, well, such and such a worker, you know, died on the job, was killed on the job, they fell from the roof, they were crushed by a machine, they were electrocuted. And they'll often say, well, the police investigated, and it was an accident. And that's the end of it. In other words, what, what, that, what those reporters really are saying, though they don't understand it so clearly, is they're saying it wasn't a, an intentional homicide. No one tried to kill that worker overtly. But these deaths are not accidents. There's nothing accidental. There's nothing, nothing random about those deaths. They're absolutely predictable, and they're absolutely preventable. And they're the result of, in most cases, they're the result of a choice that was made, or a series of choices that were made or not made by an employer, just as much as a homicide is the result of a choice made by the individual who, who ends up killing that person. Now, it's not overt. No one said, I want to kill this person. I want to kill this, the fellow who fell off the roof. But the decision not to provide fall protection led to that fatality. And we can't allow that to go on. We can't allow, not only can we not allow the fatalities to go on, but the lack of outrage, the acceptance of worker fatalities as just occupational hazards, you know, it's, it's just a fact of life. We shouldn't let that go on. And we should be raising that over and over again. Why was that acceptable? The thing that really makes this feel worse is, you know, we follow the literature very carefully on what's going on in a lot of different industries, and right now in the um, food industry, there's a lot of, there's a tremendous amount of discussion about the humane treatment of animals. In fact, um, I just sent, someone just sent me the new issue of Rolling Stone, has a long piece about um, slaughter, beef slaughterhouses and the humane treatment of beef, and what's going on in those, and, you know, if you're, you know, Tyson's now has a, a new program for the humane treatment of animals. And what's missing in that phrase, of course, is before they're slaughtered. But, um, you know, Blunderball has a program for the humane treatment of turkeys before they're slaughtered. And this is being driven, of course, not only by the companies, but by consumers. If you walk into your supermarket, there are signs now saying, you know, this is where to buy the free-range chicken or the cage-free eggs. But we know what's going on in those slaughterhouses for workers. And the folks at NIOSH just did a very important health hazard evaluation at a chicken plant in South Carolina. And this is a big plant. And what they did is they looked at, first they looked at the OSHA logs and said, you know, what's going on, what's being reported in terms of hand pain, which is a big issue, of course, because people are doing repetitive motion, you know, over and over again, many times a minute, doing slicing, you know, chickens. Um, 
I think the last year they looked at, there were no cases of hand pain reported. The previous year there were like a dozen. This is a plant with many hundreds of workers. But when they brought in the equipment and the, and the physicians, they looked at carpal tunnel, they found that the, the prevalence of carpal tunnel syndrome in these poultry workers was 42%. Almost one out of two had carpal tunnel syndrome. And yet we can't, there's no outrage about that. And so while we care about the chickens, and we all want chickens to have a good life before we eat them, what I'm telling you is we have to convince America, we have to convince the media, we have to convince our political leaders, we have to convince our neighbors that we have to care as much about the workers there as we do about the chickens. So thank you all for your work. administration who has an MD degree and he's also a lawyer. Just just real easy, right? And uh, so I said, well, maybe I could do a little work and find out a little bit more about John Howard. Of course, if you Google John Howard, you've got the uh, Prime Minister of Australia. <laughs> so you really couldn't, couldn't find him. And um, so I called up the communication director at OSHA, and I said, look, uh, John Howard's coming to be our director, and uh, what kind of person is he? Is, is he a good person? Uh, we're a little bit concerned. And uh, he said to me at that point, he said, you are so lucky. And uh, it's not just the folks at NIOSH, the 1,300 folks at NIOSH that work in research that are lucky. I think it's workers that are lucky, too. Because John, as being in the communication area, I know how hard John has worked to get our information down to workers. I mean, not everyone likes to spend their weekends reading journal articles. Right? And if you're, you pr produce three or 400 journal articles a year that are peer reviewed, we've got to do a better job of getting it down to where people can actually understand and get a hold of the information. And uh, John has spent a lot of time providing us the resources to do that. So when you Google something now, the chances are you're going to find NIOSH information that you can actually understand above the fold on the computers. And that's no easy trick, and I think John has been most instrumental in doing that. So it's a pleasure to introduce John. Good afternoon, Good afternoon. Actually, Dr. Lum is, uh, is not right. He's the one that did all of those things to bring NIOSH information to Twitter, uh, to our blog sphere, uh, and to every other line of communication. Uh, it's really my privilege, uh, privilege to be here with you today. Uh, I wanted to reiterate what David said uh, when he started out his presentation. Thank you, all of you, each and every one of you. Uh, for being the legs and the arms and the speaking voice of government. Uh, government is supposed to, by law, protect all workers, and obviously there are limitations to that. But what you're doing uh, every day, uh, largely uh, quietly and silently, uh, is doing exactly what the law intends. So thank you very, very much for what you do. We're here to help you. Uh, our primary job at the National Institute uh, as the Occupational Safety and Health Act tells us, is that we are to support OSHA, we are to support the Mine Safety and Health Administration in generating new knowledge that can be used by government agencies and by academia and by you all to make the workplace safer. Uh, we try to do this in a lot of creative ways, but we're always open to new ideas. Uh, largely, our scientists generate this knowledge scientifically, which, as Max said, is really boring to read. Uh, so we have to translate it into ways that it can be taken up by you all and used effectively. So we're always open to new ideas. We have a lot of tools on our website that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but I wanted to emphasize a couple today. First of all, there are actually 18 NIOSHs. We sponsor uh, education and research centers, ERCs, throughout the United States, and some of you are here today representing those ERCs. Uh, those individuals who work in those centers carry out the mission of the Institute in their regional areas. Please, if you do not know who those people are, 
be sure you find out where your closest ERC is, what resources they can offer, and what partnerships you can develop with them. The second tool I wanted to talk about is our Health Hazard Evaluation Program. And our director of that program, Allison Temper, is actually with us today. Where are you, Allison? Please stand up. So Allison is the director of that program. And a lot of the things that you hear that are discovered in workplaces, stimulated by people like you who say, I need to have a health hazard evaluation done on this particular workplace. And as David referred to in the Pilgrim's Pride case, uh, where we looked at a chicken and poultry processing plant, that was an HHE. So please become familiar with how that program can be used by you, what the requirements are. Please seek out Allison if you do not know already about that program. Please do that, because I think it's an important tool. The other person I wanted to introduce is Pietra Czech. Pietra, would you stand up? Uh, Pietra is Director of our Office of Agricultural Safety and Health. Now, unlike OSHA, uh, we spend a lot of time and a lot of taxpayer investment in the agricultural safety and health area. We actually fund now 11, I think, agricultural safety and health centers throughout the United States. Some extremely prominent, like at UC Davis, uh, in New York, uh, and other places. These are centers devoted solely to agricultural safety and health issues. So if you have that kind of interest and you work with that population, please let Pietra know so that we can bring you into partnership also. NIOSH does a bunch of other things, and in fact, I think we all could probably say quite honestly that when the Congress doesn't know where to put something, but it's related to worker safety and health, uh, they often give it to NIOSH. So we actually uh, have programs in workers' compensation uh, for the Department of Energy, for the Atomic Weapons Employees. And we also have recently been able to host the World Trade Center Health Program, which is a health program working with the Department of Justice in the September 11 Victims Compensation Fund. So NIOSH spans a, uh, a large scope of, uh, of work, but primarily it's here to serve workers and to serve worker advocates, to serve labor unions, to serve employers, to serve practitioners. So please get acquainted with our website. You can go to NIOSH.gov, which I thank Dr. Lum for getting us uh, that URL address. Uh, and download all of our materials. Get to know your ERCs. Get to know the Health Hazard Evaluation Program. Please uh, call me anytime. My email address is Z, as in zebra, K, Z, one, at cdc.gov. Ask me any question, and I'd be happy to put you in touch with one of our experts uh, uh, that work at NIOSH. So, again, thank you very, very much for all of the work that you do. Uh, it is much appreciated by, by all of us, especially those of us. I'm Charlotte Brody. I'm the Health Initiatives Vice President for the Blue Green Alliance. And um, we were one of the many groups that submitted comments, uh, really excited that NIOSH was looking at the carcinogens policy, and so pleased the new policy will recognize other authoritative bodies so that if any other government agency, IR for the NTP, has said something is a carcinogen, NIOSH will say, okay, it's a carcinogen, now what are the, what are the applications? Well, once, there's one step there, but we can talk about right. that. Right, but, but, but we'll focus on the occupational impact yes, of that Yes, you got that, you got the step. <clears throat> but the second part of the proposed rule, where you say you're going to spend NIOSH dollars setting uh, REL setting um, recommended exposure limits at one in a thousand cancer risk, so that you're saying that you're recommending that workers have ten times less protection than anyone else. Um, I just, I question why that seems like a good use of your resources when you could be putting time into figuring out are there safer alternatives, are there ways to eliminate exposures, rather than setting RELs that we know um, are based on limited information and aren't protected. Excellent, excellent point. Second of all, are you coming to our meeting on the 16th? <laughs> um, uh, someone else from my shop is Okay, great. 
Uh, because, you know, the, the, the major point I want to make, uh, not related to the specific issue you're talking about, is that NIOSH uh, survives uh, scientifically by interaction. And we can't get it right unless we hear from you and from everybody else. The comment period uh, for the NIOSH proposed uh, carcinogen classification slash recommended exposure limit policy is the 13th of February. So if you're interested, please go on the website and please send the comment to the NIOSH docket. Okay, so thank you very much for the comments. I'm sure you responded to the request for information and you will respond to this. And at the meeting, I think it's an open question. You know, when you, when you put out a proposed policy, you have to put some stake in the ground. You have to say, okay, this is what we think. Now, what does everybody else think? The major impetus, I think, for us, if you look behind the policy, the 1 in 1,000 target risk level is, sure, we could set it at all sorts of different levels, but how well do we fulfill our responsibility working in partnership with OSHA, given the OSHA policy with the 1 in 1,000? Now, that's, a, that's an important point. It may not be the whole point, and you may argue, I got some other ideas for you. And indeed, you could go ahead and do that, but then I want you to do some other stuff too. I may want you to set it at other levels. I may want you to mention those levels, but that's, I understand where you're at at 1 to 1,000. Whatever the reason, please give it to us because it's still an open issue. We have not decided it's a proposed policy, and we like interaction. So thank you very much. No, no, we have enough on this, but I'll, I'll, there are other good reasons for it, which I'll talk to Charlie. Okay. I guess from WorkSafe um, in Oakland, California, and my question is for the leadership of, of OSHA. I, um, so I understand there is a memorandum of understanding between the Department of Labor and um, USCIS um, in, uh, Custom and Immigration, immigra or ICE, right? So when there is an ongoing investigation, um, about some type of labor dispute that ICE will stand down. I wanted to know what has been your experience in the kind of application of that MOU and what happens once the investigation is over. Our experience is that the, um, the program works. In fact, if we're doing an investigation, um, there is a stand down that follows that. Um, our investigations go for a very long time. Um, they, they sometimes can go for many years, but um, what unfortunately I can't tell you is what happens afterwards. But, um, you know, I can tell you though, while the investigation is going on though, um, ICE does stand down. Yeah, my name is Steve Zeltz, I'm with the Injured Workers National Network. And I'm raising the issue of two points, and I, maybe you can respond to it as well, uh, Dr. Howard about the case of Becky McLean, who was a molecular biologist at Pfizer. She made a health and safety complaint, was fired by Pfizer. There was no OSHA investigation in the laboratory. And then she was retaliated against uh, after making the OSHA complaint, and won a federal lawsuit, and now her husband is being retaliated against, who works for the federal government. And the question, that's one question, what is being done about retaliation against whistleblowers? If you win a federal lawsuit, for an OSHA complaint and yet you continue to be retaliated against your family, what does that say about a worker who even doesn't win a lawsuit? So that's one question, protection of Becky McLean and her husband. The second question is biotechnology and nanotechnology because workers in biotech laboratories are being contaminated and synthetically developed bio, uh, genetically engineered products are going out into the environment, the farm workers and others, and they're getting sick. So what kind of studies are being done to protect biotech workers and farm workers from possible contamination and illness from genetically engineered uh, products that are going out into the environment. Uh, yeah, the specific case that uh, this gentleman mentioned um, actually closed long before we got to OSHA, so um, we can't, there's nothing much I can comment on or, or say about that. The current case though, which I didn't know about, would come under the Office of Special Counsel, because um, well, OSHA covers whistleblower protection for 21 different statutes, or actually 22 statutes, they're all private sector. And then federal workers are covered by a different agency, um, which we try to work closely with, and hopefully they're taking this case on. But the basic issue, though, is 
that we find in many cases is that the other statutes that protect workers for raising health and safety concerns are much stronger than the OSHA 11C provision. So for example, we've had, I just heard about a case this morning, for example, where a worker raised a concern um, and was retaliated against, but we heard about it after the 30 days, but we felt that that case also would be covered under one of the environmental protection agency statutes that we enforce. We enforce clean water, clean air, pipeline safety. So there are many examples where if we could find another statute which is protective of workers raising that concern, we will try to use it. The other though, advice that we give to workers is that if two workers get together and talk about a concern and talk about raising that concern, even if only one worker raises it, if two or more workers discuss that and the worker raises it and retaliate against, is retaliated against, that's also, can, that complaint can be raised with the National Labor Relations Board, which has many offices and, and resources around the country and different mechanisms to get people back to work, get their job back. Um, and so we highly recommend it. We are working now with NLRB, and this is the sort of thing also to think about, um, because we really need, we're committed to finding any statute we can that protects that worker. Sure, and uh, you know, the issue of nanotechnology is a very big one, and one that I think I'm gonna take the end of your question, what are we doing about it? Uh, NIOSH has invested uh, tens of millions of dollars in nanotechnology research on the implication side. What are the safety and health implications of nanotechnology? Not on the application side, because that's what you read about in all the press, how wonderful nanotechnology is going to be in nanomedicine, materials uh, development, etc. So we have spent uh, the greater part of the last decade looking at nanotechnology from the implication side. We have a slew of materials on our website about the responsible development of nanotechnology, about how workers can be best protected, safe handling of nanotechnology. All of that is available on our website if any of you are interested in it. Uh, it is a, um, a, a moment in time that we need to grasp because if we don't figure out how to protect workers against these engineered materials at very small scale, which can end up in all sorts of parts of the body, then we're gonna have another asbestos epidemic on our hands. So this is a point in time that all of us need to be aware of where nanomaterials are being used, how they're being used, and how exposure to them is being controlled. So if anyone wants any more information, please call me, please send me an email. We'll get you in touch with the folks who are doing that research at NIOSH. Yes, uh, biotech. biotech. Oh, the same, well, the same issue, It's although it precedes us in time, because biotechnology started in the late 90s and through the mid 90s. And the interesting thing there is that the genetic modification of a lot of, uh, of foods, for instance, as the argument goes on in, uh, in Europe, et cetera, is the same sort of thing. What are the implications of working with materials that have uh, biotechnology? So nanotechnology actually arose from biotechnology coupled with the engineering side. So it's, to me, it's one continuum. Uh, this question is for Dr. Howard. Uh, thank you, first of all, for the research that NIOSH did on silica exposure to workers involved in hydraulic fracturing. Uh, Wyoming is working on uh, rewriting its oil and gas rules, including for drilling, well servicing, and special well servicing. Uh, they just completed the well servicing rules. I brought this up. They said it was too late, they're, but they're taking on special well servicing next year. How do we get NIOSH involved in that rulemaking? Do you have to be invited to come and testify? Who has to invite you? How can we get you involved so that research is made available to the Wyoming OSHA Commission? Relates to NIOSH participating in state legislation is often a very touchy matter because we are part of the federal government and this we are in a federal system where states have sovereignty over their own laws. But our research is often used and cited by people in that state, so in Wyoming, to use NIOSH research and to speak on that. We risk to that question, that is not a problem. Actually, going in front of a state legislature is a little bit of a problem for us.
But supporting act we do call I have uh, met with the Colorado Commission uh, on Oil and Gas. Uh, we partner OSHA in this area. OSHA's doing a So we're really happy that we're to this. This is a enormous industry now, and it will become larger in the future. If anybody lives anywhere in North Dakota or South Dakota or Colorado, West, etc., this will be a very big deal as we go through time. Our um, charge in NIOSH right now for our researchers is to characterize fully from the process of bringing sand and water to the pad site all the way to backflow and then to transport the material out of the site. We want to characterize the health and safety implications of what the industry calls the extraction of type oil. It's done by the method called hydraulic fracturing, which are a whole bunch of sand and water.